Lisa will be holding a drawing for a chance to win one of Tom's books, and the winners will be notified after the talk. And so please join in welcoming Mr. Tom Ramos. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I guess you're wondering why I gathered you all here. Uh, no, it's, we're going to talk about, again, the history of our laboratory. And um, it might be interesting to some people that I, we, in the last lecture, I never even mentioned the laboratory and it's the history of the laboratory. But it's important in my mind as I was going through this. By the way, this history started when Bruce Goodwin, our associate director, asked me to, to do some research on, on a, an atomic device that was developed during the 1950s. I started that, and I kept asking myself the question, well, where the hell did this come from? Where did this come from? And I kept going back and back. And eventually started asking a question to myself, why on earth did this place get created in the first place? Why are we here in Livermore? And, and, and so it brought back, and I realized, uh-oh, Bruce was asking me to do this, now I'm doing that. So I went back to him, but he loved what I was doing, thank God. And so this spread into basically a history of, of how we got to where we are. And it became intriguing. And then by the end of this, you'll, you'll, it actually got heroic what, what, uh, what people ahead of us accomplished. And we have a, a, quite a legacy. And the other thing, uh, this is Manhattan Project, the title of this. And of course, I'm afraid people will say, oh, I know, God, I've been through so many movies about the Manhattan Project. I know, I know it, damn, you know, geez. But as I mentioned in the first lecture, this is uh, revisionist history of a sort. I think, I really feel confident that many of you will see things today about the Manhattan Project that you never knew before. And you'll, you'll learn something. We'll, we'll see where we, we go with that. And with that, let's begin. And uh, OK, so at the end of last lecture, we had, uh, I had described the, uh, basically what you should have gotten out of it is this man named Ernest Orlando Lawrence created a laboratory, the U University of California Radiation Lab, or the RAD Lab, back in 1931. And it became a center of American physics in the 1930s. As I mentioned later, about five Nobel laureates will come out, and, and then Lawrence himself be the sixth uh, Nobel laureate to come out of this facility. And uh, when nuclear fission is discovered, it's discovered in Berlin, Germany. It's discovered in December 1938. Hitler is running the government there, and within 10 months, World War II will erupt. And Lawrence, among others, got a deep concern about Hitler developing an atomic bomb with this new discovery and pushed really hard to get the attention of the government. Instead, uh, the guy who is basically what we'd now call the president's scientific advisor, Vannevar Bush, who later would create Raytheon Corporation, but Bush, Bush was not certain you could even make an atomic bomb. And the early calculations were, oh, you'd need you know, many tons of uranium to make a bomb. It's not, it can't be made a bomb. So he was very skeptical of Lawrence's uh, push for this. Nevertheless, Lawrence uh, realized, based on a paper written by John Wheeler and Niels Bohr, that in order to make a bomb, you had to separate one isotope of uranium, uranium-235, from natural uranium. And if you could put that together, now you're down to 50 pounds or so. You get 50 pounds of that, now you got an atomic bomb. Now it is very viable to be in a, something that could be carried on an aircraft. And he gets spun up. And Lawrence begins to realize that the secret to doing this would be to separate out the isotopes of uranium. OK, so and he brings this back to Vannevar Bush again. And he's pushing. And, he push, and he, the greatest help comes from the British. Actually, we have a thing called the Maud Report. It's led by a young physicist named Mark Oliphant. In my mind, and this is just me, if we have any British people out there listening, I'm sorry, but Mark Oliphant was to Britain like Lawrence was to America. He was this hard-driving, intelligent man that knew how to get things done. And Oliphant gets, uh, really steers the Maud Report being written, and gets it through, and then finally Bush reads the Maud Report and realizes, oh, why don't you tell me? All I got to do is get 50 pounds of this stuff together. We can do it. So he begins to get together a program. But first, he has to get permission, and he goes to see President Roosevelt in um, October 1940, I think it was. He goes to see Roosevelt, presents the information to him. And by this time, Roosevelt gives him the green light, get this thing started. All right. Now, um, let me take a step backwards here. Um, 
the big thing, again, at the time, what they were worried about was separating the isotopes of uranium, gathering it together, and then forming it into a critical mass, as we call it, to make an atomic bomb. And at, by this time, there were three scientific methods th being thought of to do that, to separate them out. The calutrons invented by Lawrence were called the electromagnetic process. That was one. Another one was to use gas diffusion. This came from the British, actually. This was a method of separating elements that was developed in a British laboratory back in the 19th century. And, uh, and uh, Oliphant and other British physicists, the first thing they, they could think of is to go back to that technology developed in the 1800s and devote it to maybe we can use that same technology, gas diffusion. Basically, you have a very thin membrane and uh, it naturally, uh, as you hear, as, as it goes up, as the gases go up, the lighter gases go to the top, the, low, the heavier gases go to the bottom. And so the lighter gases, as they go through the membrane at the top, if you collected them, excuse me, you'd be preferentially gathering the lighter elements. And you can get the uranium-235 versus the uranium-238, which would be lower down. That sounds good, except to make uranium a gas, you have to make it into uranium hexafluoride. That's six fluorine atoms connected to the uranium atom, and I'll make it a gas at a certain temperature. And fluorine is not really kind to delicate little membranes trying to separate molecules. And uh, what they were finding uh, was that it was horrendous trying to get these filaments put together that could work, make the gas diffusion work. So it wasn't working too well. Uh, another one was gas centrifuge, which frankly became more of the recent things, right, with the Uranians and that, the, that's the big hot technology. And it was being applied and it was being led by a guy named Jesse Beams, who was a physicist from Yale and actually was a very close friend of Lawrence's when Lawrence was an assistant professor at Yale. And Beams takes it over and he's working it. But the technology in those days to get a centrifuge to go these incredibly high velocities was way beyond the technology of the day. And, and, and things were kind of self-destructive, if you will. And it just was not working at the time. It was a good idea, but it was ahead of its time. Which left the only thing really working was the electromagnetic was Lawrence's calutrons to go. And so uh, Bush decides, well, we, all right, let's get something started. We need to start separating out the uranium. And he has an engineering team put together. And they realize all of these processes require a lot of energy, electricity. And so they go to the Tennessee Valley Authority, which was one of the big programs in the 1930s to establish electrical uh, power grids for the United States. And they just go there. And they discover this uh, uh, flat, relatively flat area. It's secluded. It's near the Clinch River. And locals called it Oak Ridge. It's called the Oak Ridge area. And uh, they decide this would be an ideal place to put these separation plants. And with that information, as I mentioned now, uh, Lauren, uh, Bush takes it to the president. Now, I think I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to direct your attention to that photograph I have in the upper right. This is kind of a who's who at this time. That picture was taken in March 1940, so it's right around this time. And to the far left, you can see Ernest Lawrence, his hand on his chin. chin. Right next to him is Arthur Compton, uh, two Nobel laureates. So these are the two Nobel laureates. Now, if you remember from last week, Arthur Compton and, and uh, Ernest Lawrence actually shared laboratory rooms back at the University of Chicago uh, back, <laughs> back in the day, back in the late 1920s. Uh, the guy in the middle, sitting in the back, that's Vannevar Bush. Before him, with his hands clasped together, his name, his name is Conant. Uh, he's the president of Harvard, Harvard University. Behind him is Carl Compton, who's president of MIT. And finally, to the far right, is the only one in that picture who does not, is not a PhD. He's an amateur physicist, but that's Alfred Loomis. Loomis, I, I introduced you to last, last week as the man kind of behind Lawrence, and a lot of Lawrence's schemes, uh, it was Loomis who would be the, the guy who could get the funding going and that. And a lot of historians kind of treat Lawrence with contempt, that he was not the really true scientist. You know, he was too involved with getting money, getting things to go. And all I can say is those people never were involved with a real project, because to make a real project go, it's not enough to have a good idea. You also need the backing you need the money, you need the funding, you need everything else to make it happen. Lawrence was not simply a really good experimentalist. He was a man 
with a, with a fervent desire to get the mission accomplished. And he found Loomis was that uh, gentleman who could make things happen quite a bit. And he's in there. So this is your who's who in March of 1940. And remember, uh, last week I also showed you Loomis's wife, Manette uh, Lawrence, and uh, Loomis became that close friends that uh, Loomis's wife, Manette, decided to finally take it in. She had Lawrence posed, and she created that bust of Lawrence, which they made into a bronze, which for some reason, the good people here decided to stick up on the corner and put it in the corner of the lobby in 111. To me, that's it's the historical significance of that bust is much greater than that. So who knows? But right now, it's stuck in the corner. But if you want to see that, it's, it's a great historical piece. And all right, so now he gets, Bush, Bush has the, the, the permission, start an atomic program. Oh, and by the way, how about doing it before Hitler gets an atomic bomb? To do that, it's one thing to deal with people like Lawrence, who are really good scientists. They can create laboratories, fine. But now you need to produce something. And to get onto a production scale is beyond the means of typical scientific laboratories. Now you need a more business-like production process to go. So Bush takes the idea, and he, makes, and he meets with the chief of staff of the Army, General George Cutlet Marshall. Sits down with Marshall. Uh, this is still 1940, but they're not dummies. They realize war in Europe is coming, and it's only a matter of time before the United States gets involved in war in Europe. But uh, Bush explains the problem to Marshall. Marshall has enough wherewithal. He's not a fool. He understands the real issue is, OK, we need to make big factories that can separate the uranium in order for us to put it together, make an atomic bomb. And that's not going to be a trivial process. And so he had a thing he created, uh, uh, Supply and Services Administration within the Army, but headed by a General Summerall. And he gives the mission to them. Marshall says, all right, make it happen. And they appoint, uh, they, they go to the engineers, they go to the Army engineers to put this together. And they appoint the uh, district engineer for the district of um, Syracuse, New York, upstate New York to head the project. And it turns out his name is Marshall, but it's James C. Marshall. He's not, he's not related to George C. Marshall. But Colonel Marshall then gets the mission. And he calls this new project the, um, the Development of Separate Materials Project, the DSM project, which, which gives you an idea. That's the mission he was given. You need to make some plants that can separate out the uranium. So he, gives it, he calls it the Separate Materials Mission. Okay? But as his pro project starts growing, he has to move his headquarters out of Syracuse and in, into the lower district of New York into, and where their offices are in, on Manhattan Island. So he just changes the name to the Manhattan Project. And he puts together that project is going to take place there. Now, Colonel Marshall, classic, classic uh, kind of bureaucrat, if you will. He wants, before he, he'll put any kind of effort into Oak Ridge or to building these plants, you have to convince them that the ideas will work. And he's like, they're, they're, you got three competing technologies. They're each trying to establish themselves. And he says, well, wait. I'm, let's wait and figure out which one will work, and then that will go. Well, Bush, Vannevar Bush, going back, no, this is the United States of America. We'll, we'll just invest in all three. And later on, we'll figure out which one worked. But in the meantime, let's get all three working. And Bush, Bush, I'm sorry, uh, Colonel Marshall is just not that kind of person. He's too cautious. And so Bush goes back to General Marshall, Chief of Staff, and says, look, General, in two weeks I'm meeting with President Roosevelt, and I'm going to have to give a report on the atomic program. And this is not going to look good. We haven't even purchased anything. We haven't even started factory number one. Marshall gets the idea. He gets the message. He goes back down to his uh, supply organization he created. And they don't re totally relieve Marshall, but they appoint, they're going to appoint somebody above him, that kind of bureaucratic move. And they call in um, Colonel, uh, <clears throat> the time, Colonel Dick Groves, uh, who is a tough, no-nonsense engineer. And Groves, I, again, I've read some histories where Groves is just this gruff engineer, you know, sm cigar-smoking engineer who uh, he doesn't understand what the physicists want, but just tell me what you want, and I'll, I'll try to get it moving and that kind of stuff. But now, Groves, he's the son of an army chaplain. He was fourth in his class at West Point. He was not a dummy. He was an extremely smart guy. And uh, when Marshall needed a new office building 
for the Department of War, Groves was the guy they picked to build it. That became the Pentagon. So Groves is the guy who, who orchestrated the construction of the Pentagon. He's a mover. He can get things done, okay? And he gets the mission. Groves was fought it. He wanted to, he wanted, by this time, World War II has started. The United States is in the war. This is approaching 1943. Groves wanted to command a, a battalion of engineers, uh, combat engineers. And they said, no, you're going to do this. And, and he said, yes, sir. And he starts it up. And within 48 hours, he purchases Oak Ridge. And he gets the program started, gets that program started. Um, now, uh, fortunately, Colonel Marshall's deputy back at Syracuse is Lieutenant Colonel uh, Ken Nichols. Nichols is uh, another one of these exceptional officers. <clears throat> he, has a, he has a PhD in hydraulic engineering that he got from European universities, well-educated, well well-versed. And he's also a, a, a guy that gets things done. And so Groves keeps Nichols. So he kind of, Marshall kind of gets sidestepped, but he brings in Nichols, makes him his deputy, and says, make it happen, Colonel. Now, the two of them, it turns out that Dick Groves and Ken Nichols knew each other from years earlier they were also both West Pointers. Nichols graduated, I think, third in his class at West Point. Both smart engineers in the Army. And they both, uh, at one time, went, went through the jungles of Nicaragua, trying to figure out a path to make a, another Panama Canal kind of thing through Nicaragua. So they knew each other from the 1920s. They're together again now. And Nichols gets the job of making this thing work. And basically, Gross says, all right, I got Oak Ridge. Make it happen. So Nichols gets together. And as he says, he wrote an autobiography, which I've gone through. It's extremely interesting. And he, first thing he does is he's trying to get together with these physicists to figure out how to do things. Now, it should take a sidestep here. Um, I'm a physicist. And of course, I've been a weapons designer. And we're really good. We sit there. We, phys we designers, we sit there. We get on a computer. And we look at it. And we say, OK, I need this piece. It has to be one centimeter by so-and-so. Make it. And you look at the engineer, and you say, make it. And then the engineer comes back and says, well, OK, but what if I make it 1.1 centimeters? No. What? I'm sorry. What part did you not understand? Make it one centimeter. The computer screen is very clear. The computer screen says one centimeter. And, and so then, of course, the engineer will come back to you and say, well, I just made one that's 0.95 centimeters. Will that work? And that's when the, you know, the, typically the physicist will, will just look at you like the deer looking in this. And so he has to go back, redo the calculations, figure out if that will work and all that. So, so those of you who are engineers understand what I'm saying. Uh, Nichols is in here. He's with a bunch of PhD Nobel laureate physicists who say, well, go ahead, just make the bloody thing. And Nichols has to go back and say, well, OK, hold on. We got to do this, and we got to do that. And Nichols took on this exceptional uh, role of translating these physics principles coming out and making those engineering specifications in order to build these plants. Now, one of the things is with, um, with Lawrence's idea with the calutrons, they're going to build a plant. It's going to be called the Y12 plant. The gas diffusion plant will be called later K25 plant. But, but the big one here is the Y12 plant to, build, uh, to house the calutrons. And so Nichols gets the idea, and he realizes what, this is going to be a, a bunch of, of um, electromagnets that are going to be used to drive uranium atoms through it. They're going to go through the, they have to go through these big magnetic fields. To get the magnetic fields, this is not one huge ion magnet. They're going to be using electric fields to generate the magnetic fields. And these are huge magnetic fields. This is also 1943. Now, some of you may know this. I got a feeling many of you do not. But when you take pennies, they're all copper pennies. Well, you have copper pennies. Are you realize, and do, you, do any of you realize in 1943, if you picked up a penny, it was, it was silver white. It was made of zinc. And that's because copper was an extraordinarily valuable war material needed for the war effort. And it was incredibly short supply. And they didn't even have enough copper to make pennies out of it. So they made the pennies out of zinc. So copper was a critical thing. And you got. You got this guy named Lawrence coming to see Nichols, saying, well, we got uh, 300. We, we're going to need about 100 or 200 of these things. And each one requires about a kilometer of wires to go, you know, copper wiring around. 
And Nichols realizes, well, this, this is not going to happen. Nichols has to reinterpret that. And Silver, of course, is an excellent conductor. And many of you probably know Fort Knox is the gold reserve, but not many may know that West Point is the silver reserve of the nation. That, and having been a cadet, as many of us there knew, you had this huge silver repository in the rear end of West Point. Hopefully my speech is not going to create some sort of theft of silver from West Point, but hopefully that won't happen. But anyway, Nichols was well aware of that. So he goes up and makes an order up at, the, at West Point saying, I need, I need, uh, I forget what it was, I need 48 tons of silver right now, move, kind of thing. So he goes to Treasury, uh, who controlled the silver repository at West Point. He said, immediately, because we have to put one together, I'm going to need 12 tons of silver, to which the, tre the Treasury guy goes back and says, Colonel, I don't know how they handle this in the Army, but in the Treasury Department, we treat silver as troy ounces, not tons, kind of thing. And, and it, it kind of saved it from the, and the thing. But that was the, the, the kind of momentous challenges Nichols was doing, reinterpreting what was needed. How do I still make this work with the materials I have? And that's one example. Just screw it. We ain't got copy, copper, we'll use silver. And they dumped it in. So you had a huge amount of silver suddenly showing up at Oak Ridge uh, to make this happen. And he's, he's one of a... Now, another thing is, uh, he is a, he's a go-getter, gets things done, and in his autobiography, I thought I'd bring this out, because he dealt with a lot of people. He, uh, he dealt with Bush, he dealt with Oppenheimer, he dealt with uh, Compton, all of these great physicists and engineers. But he even writes in there that what he found was it was Lawrence, who was the most dynamic scientist he met in, in this episode in the Manhattan Project, it was Lawrence who got things done. It was Lawrence he could go to and get the organization behind him. It was Lawrence who could understand. It was also Lawrence who could explain what it is he needed in plain engineering terms. And um, I thought that was quite a, um, a good saying for that. And as a personal note, by the way, uh, I'm bringing this up. And in my book, I mentioned that these are Army engineers. And I make a point, these are Army engineers. And the reason I say it is because I was an Army engineer. And I remember when I came in, a kind of a a cult grew up within the Army back in the 60s, and it kind of continued, which was kind of an intellectual, anti-intellectual kind of thing that came up. And it kind of represented the, the general public, too. And I call it the revenge of the sea students. And, and basically, I, you know, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm not, but people, get in, people got into positions of responsibility or within the Army kind of realized, well, I was able to capture Hill 558 without having a PhD in physics. You don't need a PhD, you know, that kind of stuff. And anyway, uh, there seemed to be a prejudice against these smart people. And what I did notice in going through my research is how often, and it's not only in the Army, in the Navy too, we're, we're going to see some very intelligent naval officers, that uh, there, it's these specialists in, in the military that made things happen. They were not only smart, they, were, they were not only understood the engineering and physics principles, but they had this ethic of a mission that you have to accomplish something and you, you can't accomplish it 20 years from now, you have to accomplish it now. And these are the individuals who understood what needed to be done and also understood that you needed to get it done on time. And that was very crucial for making things operate. And the key guy at the Y-12 plant was Ken Nichols to make this happen. And um, all right, so meanwhile, Lawrence, they developed the Calutron back at Berkeley. They got it to work. The first time they, they ran it, uh, natural uranium has 0.7% uranium-235. They ran it. They ran it from one thing, and they were able to quadruple. They were able to enrich uranium four times over by making it run, by making it run through the Calutron. Uh, Lawrence's goal was to get it up above 90%, up around 96 98% pure uranium-235. So in other words, you take that in slightly enriched, what they call low, low, en low enriched uranium, and they run it through again. And you run it through again. And each iteration, you'd slowly enrich the uranium until you were getting to the specifications you needed. All right. So uh, that was all developed at Berkeley, but now you had to put it together at Oak Ridge. So Lawrence literally grabs about 100 physicists and engineers out of the Rad Lab they get on a train. I read there, one guy wrote a daily journal, you know, and, and they're all excited. They get on this train and they stopped off in um, Chicago on their way down to Oak Ridge. And they get issued boots. And they said, this is for the mud. 
And they go, what mud? You know, we're physicists. We work in laboratories. What mud? And they go, then they found out. When they get to Oak Ridge, Oak Ridge at that time was just a construction site. And when you took a step out, you were up to your ankles in red mud. So they, then they began to realize why they were getting issued all of these things. But you had these guys coming out of Berkeley, showing up at Oak Ridge, and then their job was to make the calutrons operate on a production level, not just on a proof of principle level. So they're down there, and they're doing that, and they run into problems. And uh, Lawrence is a constant presence down there. You might imagine any kind of thing like this, it's never been done before, you're doing it, things start short circuiting. Uh, they get uh, uranium deposits on the ducts coming through. The uh, miles of electrical wires creates heat. You know, you have an electric current going, that's going to generate heat. At one point, they had so much heat, they thought the whole place was going to melt. And then Lawrence actually got the uh, fire department coming, so I bring fire hoses on top of the uh, white, on top of the coyote trench just to keep them cool. So Lawrence was a constant present there, but we did have a bunch of physicists. And two, I'd like to bring out that he recruits out of Berkeley, a guy named Herb York. He's, he's from upstate New York. Uh, work, but he worked on the 184-inch uh, cyclotron at Berkeley, getting that run, and then Lawrence uh, realized his talents and boom, bop, bop, had him doing other things with the 184-inch cyclotron, and then when he needed people in Oak Ridge, he said, Herb, I need you down in Oak Ridge, and Herb gets on the train and heads down. Another one uh, is a mathematician named Chuck Leith, who we're going to hear more about, too, when we get more into the laboratory. Uh, Leith was a mathematician. Uh, I see there's Joe Nielsen's up here with me, and we were office mates a few years ago. And our next, our neighbor right next door in the office right next to ours was this older gentleman who, by God, was younger than I am now. I call him, I thought at the time, I thought he was this older gentleman. And it was Chuck Leith. So Chuck, this mathematician, was right in the office. And little did I know at the time that I had a, a laboratory icon in the office next to me. But Chuck Leith is another one of these guys that shows up at Oak Ridge early on. And he's, uh, he's one of the foremost computer scientists in the world. He will become. And I'll talk more about him later as we get more into the laboratory. But while well, Leith is down here, he actually models the process, the Calutron process, and how to improve it and do these things. And he's using these analog computers at the time, these really uh, crude, crude computers that were available at the time to start doing some computer science and applying it to what was happening. All right, so now you got this plant going, and what they did was uh, you have the, 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 the big magnets. Now, it's based on 184 inch. You can't take a 184-inch cyclotron and stick it down. This thing's monstrous. So they change it from, rather from being a cyclotron into more of a mass spectrometer. So it's, it's more hollow, if you will, lighter. And, and then to make space, they rotated the thing 90 degrees. So instead of having this big circular magnet, as we typically see back in Berkeley, they just rotate them 90 degrees, and now you can get more of them aligned. Lawrence's goal was, I think it was 10 grams a day, hope, hoping to make 10 grams of U-235 a day, and then they did the calculations. You're gonna need so many hundreds of these things to do that. And what they did was they got so many of them, and they put them in, a, in an oval shape, and they called them a racetrack, for you know, obvious reasons. They kind of look that way. And there you can see the racetracks going there, and they designated some bureaucrat in the Manhattan Project who apparently got good grades in high school in algebra calls it Site X. So Oak Ridge became Site X. Um, really imaginative guy, I know. Uh, could have said Upsilon, right? If he was a classy guy, was it Site Upsilon? No, no, Site X. I mean, Christ. Uh, but anyway, we, get, we have to deal with these people. But so Oak Ridge becomes Site X. And there you have the racetracks. And there were two racetracks were made. And boom, boom. Now, the other thing is now they got to get technicians in to run these things. Some of the physicists are running back to Berkeley, and so they get local technicians to go, and they blow it. They're, they're just nothing seems to work, and so they take it apart. Lawrence has the whole thing taken apart, puts it back together again. This time, the second time around, they bring in, and it turns out they're mostly women, young women, high school graduates to come in. And uh, I was told this might be a not a politically correct language, but anyway, but it turns out these young women actually read the instructions, okay, and, and it worked, and they got the plant to work. So uh, now if that's offensive to anyone out there, I'm sorry, and maybe we can erase this part of the uh, recording of the speech, but it was the young women who made the bloody thing work, and, and uh, you can see there's a picture of them there in the lower picture, 
And they became the object of the, the book, Janet Beards wrote a book, um, the, what it was, The Atomic City Girls. And she actually came to the Bankhead Theater in Livermore and you know, gave, a, gave a lecture on her book, or, or here, right. And that's, who is she talking about? She's talking about these young women who are actually making the Calutrons run. And you see they're, they're standing on a console. What they're doing, which takes talent, is they're adjusting the electrical circuits in such a way that when you adjust the electrical circuits, you're adjusting the magnetic field. And remember, what you want is you've got these uh, ions going around, and as they're going around, they're separating according to their weight, and the U-235 making a closer path than the U-238, and they have two receptor cups at the end, and they're not gonna move, the cups are there, and what you're trying to do is adjust the magnetic fields so that the beams come down onto the cups. And that takes a bit of talent, a little bit of, you know, okay, just adjust it so they know what they're doing. And that's what those ladies are doing. Turns out they were successful enough that the enriched uranium that was used to make the first atomic bomb dropped over, that came from these, this plant, from those operators running. The calutrons worked, and they provided the fuel for the first atomic bomb in, in the war that would be used later. All right, now, um, ah. I've concentrated on uranium. Meanwhile, and I mentioned back in the slide, I'll talk about plutonium later, so now I'll talk about it. You might remember from last week, and if those, some, there are some of you, I can't believe this, but there may be some of you, maybe back in WebEx land, who did not see my lecture last week. And shame on you, I can't believe that. But anyway, you then don't know what I'm talking about. But if you were listening last week, you would have heard that um, while back at the Rad Lab, Lawrence is asked to create the MIT Radiation Laboratory to study radar, and he brings his two chief lieutenants, Louis Alvarez and Ed McMillan, out to, to make that place run. But right before that, right before McMillan got, got picked up by Lawrence, said, you know, I need you in, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, McMillan gets interested when he reads about Otto Hahn's discovery of nuclear fission in Berlin. And says, well, hell, I can do that. You know, that's any kind of good investigative physicist can say, well, can I duplicate that? And he, he decides to do it. Instead of using radium to generate the neutrons, which is what um, Otto Hahn was using back, uh, back in the day, he has the most powerful accelerator in the world at his, at his hands, a 60-inch uh, psychotron. So he uses the 60-inch psychotron to generate neutrons, and then he drives the neutrons into uranium foils at the Rad Lab. And sure enough, he sees the nuclear fission. He sees all this energy coming out. But Macmillan, being Macmillan, goes more into it. And unlike Otto Hahn, who's a chemist and predominantly wants to look at the chemical uh, 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 refuse that's left over, and that's when he found the barium and stuff and deduced the uh, fission, Macmillan looks at the radioactivity coming out of it. And just like Fermi had discovered back in the 1930s, if you shoot neutrons into materials, you create new elements, which are called radioisotopes. And Fermi very religiously recorded all of these new radioisotopes he had discovered with each new element of the periodic table. So you had, you had a, a database of these radioisotopes. And Macmillan takes his uranium foil, and now he looks at the radioactivity at a much greater degree of uh, than had been done previously. And he gets to see some of the radioisotopes that have been seen earlier, and he can gather by their energy and their half-lives what's going on. But what he sees is this big peak of something that's never been seen before in terms of energy, the energy of, this, of these uh, beta rays. What's, what's happening when you have a radioisotope, when it decays, it typically decays by what we call beta decay, which is a high-energy electron and you look at the energy of those electrons, okay, and you look at two things. First, the energy that's coming out, and which is a, it's a spectrum, but it centers on one central point. The other thing you look at is their half-life on how rapidly this stuff is decaying. And there's one element that seemed to be different than anything he'd seen before, and he got a suspicion that this was what was happening with uranium-238, okay, Wheeler and Bohr came up and said, well, it's uranium-235 that's fissioning. That's causing all the fissions. But the vast majority of the uranium atoms are uranium-238. So what Macmillan hypothesized is those atoms, those nuclei, instead of splitting, they absorb the neutron, 
And so they became uranium-239. They got one more neutron. They just absorbed it. And that uranium-239 became more radioactive than uranium-238. And it was beta decaying. And that's what we were seeing. And that means when you beta decay, basically one of the neutrons in the nucleus changes into a proton. It, it shoots out an electron and a neutrino, and, and it becomes a proton, which means it becomes one element higher up in the periodic table. Well, uranium was the highest element in the periodic table. So Macmillan hypothesizes this is a brand new element that's never been seen before. And uranium is named after the planet Uranus. So he picks the next planet up as Neptune. So he calls this thing with a half-life of about four and a half days, Neptunium, named after the planet Neptune. OK? And so, boom. So he writes all his papers. Yay, I've discovered, we've discovered a brand new element. And that's at the point where, where Lawrence comes in and says, Ed, I need you in Cambridge. And so Ed drops his stuff, which will win him the Nobel Prize in a couple of years, but picks up his stuff and heads off to Cambridge, Massachusetts now to work on radar. While he's there, he gets, a, he gets a Western Union telegram from a chemist working down the hallway from at the Rad Lab. His name is Glenn Seaborg. Ed, if you don't mind, I'd like to pick up your research where you left off. And Macmillan says, sure, fine, Glenn, go ahead and do it. And Glenn Seaborg then goes into it. Seaborg is a chemist. Now, he's a, a just outstanding chemist. And he sees the Neptunium. And he comes up with a method of separating out the Neptunium from the samples. So he gets a more or less pure sample of Neptunium. And he watches. And sure enough, the Neptunium itself, it decays. It's radioactive. And it decays. And it decays into the next higher element. All right? So you have uranium, which is 92. It, becomes element, uh, it decays into element 93, which they call Neptunium. And it's Seaborg that sees now the, the Neptunium, element 93, decays once again to become element 94. And keeping with the same scheme, the next planet out is Pluto. So Seaborg calls the new element plutonium. All right, and boom. And then he me they measure the half-life of plutonium. And unlike Neptunium, which was four and a half days, this stuff has a half-life of 24,000 years. So it's, it's, uh, it's pretty stable. It'll last a while. And like uranium-235, it has an odd number of neutrons. And I'm not going to go into the nuclear physics of this. And I mentioned to you last week, this is based on what we call Fermi or Fermi-Dirac statistics, why this is important, and Wheeler and Bohr. I'm not going to bore you with a physics lecture. I know. Don't, don't leave. You don't have to leave. I won't go that way. But anyway, plutonium has an odd number of neutrons, the way uranium-235 was. And so they suspected well, this is probably going to be like uranium-235, because it has similar types of characteristics. And if I look at the, the Bohr-Wheeler paper, you know, this matches the same description. So they shoot neutrons at this plutonium, and lo and behold, it fissions. And it fissions even more rapidly than uranium-235. It's more fissionable. And just, just the way they predicted it was. And so Seaborg announces, we've discovered a new material. Oh, and by the way, it's like uranium-235. You can make an atomic bomb with this stuff. All right, And that becomes now the second alternative fuel for a bomb come up. So not only do you have to separate, this becomes a different kind of problem, because now you can chemically separate plutonium from uranium, because they're chemically different elements. Now, to make plutonium, you need what you've got to do is like Seaborg, or I'm sorry, like uh, Macmillan did, you take uranium-238, you take your natural uranium, and you inundate them with neutrons. The neutrons get absorbed into uranium-238. They become uranium-239, and then they decay into plutonium. That's how you do it. But in order to make enough of that material to make a bomb, you have to pretty much keep it going. So the, the, that process I just described has to be continuous, or it's what we call critical. That means you, uh, uh, Fermi had, had invented a way of getting enough uranium together to make this stuff go critical to make a nuclear reactor, if you will, or as they called it, a nuclear pile. Now, it's called a pile because, as Fermi had discovered, in order to get these neutrons to interact with the, with the uh, uranium, you want to slow them down. If you slow them down enough, then they, they react much more readily. And uh, the first one they were thinking about is using heavy, heavy water, which is using deuterium to slow it down. That's hard to get. It's, it's really difficult to make. 
And it was uh, a Hungarian physicist named Leo Szilard who suggested to Fermi, well, let's try carbon. And so they got pure graphite, ultra pure graphite, which is just carbon. And it turned out carbon worked fine. And so graphite worked fine. And so instead of using heavy water as a moderator, Fermi decided to use graphite blocks. And he made these huge, and he called it a pile, a nuclear pile. And what you do is you take your uranium elements and you slip them into the pile of graphite. The graphite's there to moderate the neutrons, and then the uranium's there to, to generate the fuel, to generate the, the plutonium. And you can see a picture of what these things, that they're building one. He built one in Columbia University, eight feet by six feet by 12 feet, I think, and it was subcritical. It, they, got it, they got some reactions going, but it was not enough to keep the reactions continually going. They needed to make it bigger. And uh, Bush had appointed Arthur Compton as the guy in charge of designing what the bomb would look like. And Compton then uh, enlisted Fermi then to make a pile so they can start making the plutonium. They're going to make it at the Argonne Preserve outside of Chicago. It's a big federal property. And of course, someone, they, they went on strike. The workers go on strike there. So they can't build the facility at the Argonne thing. There's a strike going on. Well, there's also a war going on, or, and so uh, uh, Fermi and, uh, and uh, Compton meet, and they decide, all right, we'll, we'll build it at a, we'll, we'll build it within the University of, Cal of Chicago, and they choose that there's a, a squash court underneath the football stands, and they build this critical reactor there. And on December 2nd, 1941, one week before Pearl Harbor, Fermi puts together a critical reactor. And it's, it works. He gets it working. Even though people, uh, DuPont, other organizations, they said, you can't do it. It's impossible. He did it. And they got it going. And uh, then Groves, our uh, Manhattan Project leader at the time, he, he says, OK, now we need to stop making plutonium as well as making uranium. So he has Oak Ridge making the uranium. And then he makes a contract with DuPont to make another plant, which they choose. They go up to Hanford, Washington. And they create a plant up there that's, very, frankly, what the Hanford plant is going to be is a bunch of these monstrous nuclear piles there just to generate the plutonium from the piles. Just as important, what never seems to be reported, everyone, you know, we all hear about the Fermi making the critical reactor and, and they make it. What does never, I don't read anywhere, is one week later, Glenn Seaborg, our good friend at the Rad Lab, develops a chemical process that can separate the plutonium from all of that spent fuel. And that's just as critical. Not only It's critical to make the plutonium, but it's just as critical you have to learn how to separate it out uh, from the spent fuel. And that's not a trivial exercise. Seaborg did it one week after they make a critical reactor. They already got a process to collect the plutonium, and that's what goes to Hanford. And the guys, uh, uh, Bush appoints Orgain Wigner, a Hungarian uh, physicist, later a Nobel laureate, and John Wheeler, who I introduced last week, and they're going to run the Hanford plant out, out in Washington, generating the plutonium. OK, meanwhile, back to the ranch, um, Compton needs to get this action going. He needs to design the atom bomb. He, he's responsible for designing the atomic bomb. And one of the leading physicists at the, uh, oh, I'm all, I, got, I got time running out. That's what you're going to warn me about. Uh, one of the leading physicists is a man named Gregory Bright. He's a Russian, puts him in charge. Bright does not have the character to run in an emergency, and he has all these arguing physicists coming together. They're trying to get the cross section for fission. And so uh, at a meeting, Lawrence suggests, well, Bright, Bright quits. Now they don't have a leader anymore. Lawrence suggests, well, I got a theoretical physicist who works for me. His name is Robert Opp Bob Oppenheimer. And so, uh, Compton draws in Oppenheimer. It makes them the head, what they call the fast fission group. But their, their, their goal is to come up with a cross section, which is a probability for uh, creating nuclear fission. Okay? And so then Oppenheimer calls a meeting together at, uh, you can see Kanto Hall, at, at, that's the Berkeley campus. You can still see that building there. Uh, and he calls all the physicists together. And they're all meeting and how they're going to go about calculating the, the uh, cross sections or the probabilities for nuclear fission. And while he's there, one of the guys invited is a physicist by the name of Edward Teller. And Teller relates, he got a question from Fermi a week before, or two weeks before. 
in which Fermi asked the question, could you get fusion, can you use the energy from a fission device to start making a fusion device? And uh, Teller says, well, I don't think so because you've got to maintain these high temperatures uh, too long, you know, and you can't, you can't keep those high temperatures running long enough to do that, so I don't think so. But then uh, there's a physicist back at the University of Chicago, Emil Konopinski, and he does some calculations with Teller, and Konopinski says, well, wait a minute, and they start doing more intense calculations, and it turns out maybe this can happen. It might be possible that you can keep the temperatures high enough long enough to make the fusion go. And then Teller comes back to Fermi and says, you know, it can happen, you can do it with these kind of uh, calculations. And Teller gives an, a name to this new device and he calls it the super. Now, Edward is a prodigy, he's a, he's a, a genius. He's from Hungary. Early in his life, he's recognized for his abilities in physics. He, uh, he uh, goes to the University of Leipzig to get his PhD, and he joins a group headed by Werner Heisenberg of the uncertainty principle fame. And his roommate, you know, the colleague you know, in, in the dormitory is Rudolf Piles, who I introduced last week as one of the authors of the Maud Report. Piles is his roommate, and uh, they're all working for Heisenberg. And uh, he graduates from there, and in the 1920s, he makes, he, he makes the acquaintance of Fermi, and Fermi and Teller become close friends. They just, they just jive together. They, their characters are such that they like each other, they work with each other, and adore each other. And of course, Teller adores Fermi. Is, Fermi is the icon of physics for the 20th century, almost, okay? And uh, let's see, he also wins a fellowship then to join Niels Bohr at his Institute for Theoretical Physics in Copenhagen. And when he goes there, he meets others. Lev, in his memoirs, you can read Lev Landau. But, but two, uh, to, this, to our story that are important, he meets George Gamow, who's a Ukrainian from Odessa, the city that's about to be invested by the Russian army, by the way. But Gamow is from Odessa, and uh, they become friends. And he also meets John Wheeler, who's also a fellow at, the, at Bohr's Institute. And they become good friends. Now later, Gamow, in 1933, escapes from the Soviet Union with his wife, and then Marie Curie gives him a job in France, and then he gets an offer, and he heads back to George Washington University in, in Washington, and he becomes the head of the physics department there. And once he's there, then he, he gets hold of Teller, and he offers him a job at, on the physics faculty of George Washington University. That's how Teller gets into America, is through George Gamow. And if you still don't know who I'm talking about, Gamow came up with the term, Gamow had this mag great imagination, and for the beginning of the universe, he called it the Big Bang. So maybe you heard of that, okay? But that's the gentleman who came, came up with the term that we later uh, TV picked up on. In the meantime, also, Oppenheimer, who's introduced, uh, Groves now needs, an, uh, he now needs to create a laboratory to design, actually design the atom bomb. His first instinct is he gets on an airplane and he flies out to San Francisco and he meets with Lawrence. Lawrence, the man who created the UCRL, then he created the MIT Radiation Laboratory, and Grove says, sir, I need you to create one more laboratory now to design the bomb. At the time, Lawrence is up to his armpits trying to get the Y-12 plant operating, and he tells Groves, I, can't, I cannot afford to get away from Y-12. It needs my help. But let me introduce you to my theoretical physicist, Oppenheimer, and maybe he, he, he's a good guy. He can get the laboratory started. Groves meets him, makes a deal, and Oppenheimer is asked to create another laboratory. Oppenheimer suggests a, a place in New Mexico that he knew as a child that's really secluded. It's on a mesa called Los, Los Alamos, and boom. And they move, and they create a laboratory up in Los Alamos, New Mexico, with Oppenheimer now leading that, that effort, okay? And now I'm gonna move fast. <laughs> so there it goes. Los Alamos is created. I am going to skip a little bit more. And a Teller is invited to join the Manhattan. He's a member of the Manhattan Project. He shows up at Los Alamos. When he arrives, uh, Oppenheimer creates a standard organization. He has an engineering division, and he has his uh, physics theoretical division, and he makes uh, Hans Bethe the head of the physics division, the theoretical division. 
Baita is a good choice. Baita uh, is one. There were two authors, by the way, in the 1930s, there were two documents that were called the Bibles of nuclear physics. One was written by Werner Heisenberg. The other one was written by Hans Baita. And so he's, he's well known. He studied how does a star live, you know, from the very beginnings of a star being formed, how does a star progress through its ages. And so he was quite an expert on nuclear, nu nuclear interactions that, un that are undertaken by stars. So he's a good choice. Anyway, but when Teller gets there, frankly, Teller felt he should have been made the head of the theoretical division. He was senior. He should have been that guy, but he wasn't. And then Bather asked him to head a group to come up with what now we would call the equation of state for plutonium. We need to understand how can we, how can we squeeze plutonium? How can we do this? How can we do that with plutonium? And Teller feels that's not, that doesn't meet his qualifications. As he, in his own words, he said, I'm a brick maker, not a brick layer. In other words, I'm, I'm here to invent stuff. I don't want to just do calculations to calculate stuff. And they get into a, basically a verbal fight. Oppenheimer steps in, breaks it up, and asks Teller, well, at least be an intermediary for Los Alamos to go around, work with the metallurgical laboratory in Chicago, other places, and Teller agrees to do that. But then Teller says, but I want you to let me lead a group to work on a super, this idea that I got with Fermi, and Oppenheimer agrees. So then Teller takes over this small group that they're going to be designing the super. I'm looking. Uh, OK, when he forms the group, one of the guys that, that, that joins his group uh, von Neumann is another Hungarian. He's a close friend with Teller from the Hungarian days. And uh, von Neumann recruits a mathematician from Poland, Lviv. Lviv. They were all in the news. Uh, this guy who was from Lviv at the time was part of Poland. And uh, his, his name is Stanislav Ulam. And Ulam comes in, and uh, von Neumann gets him into the country and makes him a Harvard fellow, where his classmate is David Griggs. And you might remember David Griggs from those of you that didn't see last week's uh, lecture, shame on you, but then you'd know what I'm talking about. But his name was David Griggs. But Griggs and uh, Ulam, they become friends. But Ulam goes on, uh, Griggs, of course, goes on to bigger and better things in the Air Force and back. But Ulam goes and becomes a mathematical instructor at the University of Wisconsin. And then uh, von Neumann comes back, grabs him, and brings him down to Los Alamos. And he joins Teller's group. And he provides a lot of mathematical background for that. Um, in the meantime, now, with people like these physicists working on it, they make a discovery. In the earlier calculations they were doing, they did not totally take into account an effect associated with Compton's discoveries that won him the Nobel Prize. And this particular Compton effect loses energy. It causes the plasma to lose energy much more rapidly than they originally they thought. And because of that, it now looks like, in their calculations, that maybe the super is not going to work. And so at a meeting where Oppenheimer would have all the group leaders come up, and Teller now heads group 15, before it's Teller's turn to get up, Teller just abruptly stands up and walks out so he doesn't have to tell Oppenheimer, we're running into problems and we're not sure anymore if the super will work. And he won't say that, so he steps out. Fermi's in there. He sees what's happening. He goes, meets with, he meets with Teller, finds out what the problem is, and then, then Fermi starts working on the problem, and he comes up with a new basic structure for how would you design such a thing to overcome this new effect that they had suddenly realized was there. And Fermi will end up giving five, a set of five lectures at Los Alamos on how to, make a, how to make a super that works. OK, then, of course, Project Y at the end of the um, just as much as Oak Ridge was uh, site X, Los Alamos becomes site Y. It's the same algebraic guy that, I guess, can't, has no imagination. And uh, anyway, they design the uh, uranium bomb, they design the plutonium bomb, and the war ends. At the end of that, by the way, um, the uh, Bradbury can take Oppenheimer, once he sees the effects of those explosions, he has this huge change in personality or character. And now he feels everything I've done was a sin. And he goes and sees President Truman and says, I have known sin. And Truman basically goes to his Secretary of State and says, is this, is this guy sane? I need, I need to check on this guy. But Oppenheimer is a very passionate character, and he, he becomes passionate that we can no longer do this nuclear research. Or definitely, and he tells Teller, no, we don't need the super anymore, so we don't need to do thermonuclear research anymore. Shuts it down. Teller goes and talks to Fermi. Fermi Fermi's too interested. He's about to create an institute for nuclear physics up in Chicago doesn't want to do it. And so in the end, 
Teller leaves Los Alamos and he joins Fermi up at the University of Chicago and so that's going to do basic physics research at Chicago again. In the meantime, uh, Los Alamos keeps going, but they, they make some refinements on, on the Manhattan Project designs they did. And in, uh, this is Operation Crossroads in 1946 in Bikini. Now they're picking a atoll in, in the Marshall Islands in the Pacific. Bikini and Iniwetok are the two major atolls. And they test an atomic explosion there. And what the reporters, when they finally, now they get to see it, this is not a wartime drop over Japan, but so a lot of reporters came to see it. The target here was a fleet of 48 or 78 ships, and uh, they're going to see what an atomic bomb could do to the 78 ships. If you can believe, my uncle was a bombardier in World War II, so I, I have my hearts with bombardiers, but the bombardier that got to do this thing missed the, the center mass. The target was the United States Nevada. It's a battleship, and they painted it orange to help the guy up there. Well, here, pick the orange one. He missed it by a mile. So I, I don't know what happened to the, something happened to the, when the Air Force left the Army, something bad happened, is all I can, <laughs> I can tell you. But this guy misses the target by a mile. And two of the ships sank. Everything else was fine. But the, the thing came out, the reporters came out and saying, well, yeah, now they got to see it. Yes, the atom bomb is this terrible thing, but not as terrible as we once thought. It's kind of the thought. And when you read the newspaper stories, that's what kind of happens out of it. So next week, we're going to hear now, we're finally going to get into the real. I'm going to take my gloves off and talk about the laboratory. And next, the title of next week's lecture is going to be The Second Laboratory. And what were the political circumstances that evolved, and they get pretty hot and heated, that would cause the government to create another laboratory on top of Los Alamos, and how that came about. And that's what we're going to go through next week. And I'm ready now to answer questions. We have two minutes to go. <laughs> Sorry, I promised 15, gave you two. Hey, Tom, we do have a first question from our WebEx audience. Um, they're asking, was the term Big Bang initially used in a pejorative sense? The term Big Bang, as I, as I remember, Gomov introduced when, and when he was becoming aware, based with the Hubble, the Hubble type uh, of, of discoveries that the universe was expanding, I think it was Gomov that came up with the, the whole concept that this must have begun as a big explosion, he gave the name Big Bang. So he was one of the guys. So maybe another guy, but Gamov usually is the guy associated with coming up first with the term Big Bang as the beginning of the universe. Are there any questions here? Did you say the books are oh, oh. at the Yes, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, this is the book. I have been there at Town Center Books here at Livermore. They ha it's on the shelf. I went in and vouched it. I even made a little poster for them put up. And also at Town Center Books in Pleasanton. They also have stocked it. It's the same lady, uh, Judy Wheeler, owns uh, both stores. And so she has stocked, she has ordered, and she's stocking up the books. And, and, uh, and that's the local, that's the best. Bonson Noble has also ordered it, but uh, I just got informed by a friend. They're out of it. They ordered some, and they, they ran out to their order. So they're not on the shelves at Bonds & Noble. But I did go to the Dublin store, and they said, yeah, yeah, we have it on order coming in. But I do know I can vouch for it. Uh, that at our local store, it's right there. You can go down, pick it up right off the shelf. And I, I'm, always, I'm always around to sign them. If you, if you like me to come and sign the books, I'll be happy. Just drop me a note, email, or anything. I'll be happy to meet with you anywhere, and we'll just sign it. Or just show up next week. <laughs> or show up next week. Any other questions in the audience? All right. Looks like we're going to end on time. Thank you, Tom. Okay. We really appreciate your time. Thank you.